Welcome to Sit Down News. Today I'm going to be speaking to you about a blog I wrote titled Harlem Heroin and the Lucchese Family. Uh, specifically, I wrote about uh, Thomas D'Ambrosio, and uh, he was known on the street as Fat Thomas. I was away with Thomas in the early 90s. Um, Thomas grew up uh, in East Harlem, and he was very proud of his neighborhood. <clears throat> East Harlem was another uh, breeding ground for organized crime, like most inner city neighborhoods. And um, Thomas spent the early part of his childhood uh, playing baseball and stickball. He was a very good uh, athlete, from what I was told. Aside from being overweight, he was very fast and he had agility. He also was very good at singing. He had a very good voice. He used to sing for us all the time. And he had told me that his aunts and, and the older women in the neighborhood used to ask him to sing. And a lot of times he would sing in the hallways of the tenements in Harlem. So back then, there was a big uh, boom with uh, heroin, or as they say in the street, Babanya. Um, people were importing the narcotics and, and, and making a large amount of money from selling it. But Thomas, at some point, probably could have been a, a, a very good athlete, but chose to um, get in the game, the heroin game. And um, there was all of his childhood friends and people who he knew from the neighborhood already, already into that business. Um, some of them were uh, the De Palermo brothers, Charlie Brody, Petey Beck, Fat Gigi, there's Angelo Cheesecake, Anthony Bowat, Angelo Prisco, he spoke of Rafi. Mo Lentini was a good friend of his, Ernie Boy, Vincent Bazile, Johnny Echoes, and the Bolt Melnish brothers, who was uh, Joey and Michael. Thomas explained that the packages that he was involved in getting used to come in Supasada. And whoever was doing it was calling out the inside of the supersad and there was stuff in a package in and he would when they would get them he would cut it up himself he even called himself a chemist he rented it up an apartment and they would cut the heroin and he would turn one package into three or, or whatever he was able to get out of it. And he had a trusted guy, a black guy from the neighborhood, and he would give it in turn to him. And that guy would push it out there. And that's how he got rid of it. And from the very beginning, Thomas became very wealthy and he was, um, you know, he was good at what he did. One of the reasons that he was successful was his uh, counter surveillance techniques. He was very counter surveillance savvy. He had told me that he bought a police scanner, a very good police scanner, and he used to listen to that religiously. And he was very good at watching. And as a matter of fact, it came back to haunt him later, but he would memorize the cause on the block that, that was supposed to be there and any cause that were, were not. And he explained the business as follows. He said to me, the difference between pushing junk or heroin is today you're in a Toyota and tomorrow you're in a Mercedes, or you're driving a Mercedes. One of the problems that Thomas was concerned about and spoke about at length was back then he called them the Nappas. So there was a group of guys that were going around 
and they were kidnapping drug dealers, obviously for the ransom and the money. And in turn, my, um, Thomas turned to the Melnish brothers who were part of a notorious gang from, from out of East Harlem. And he referred to them as the Purples and a lot of people from Harlem in New York called them the Purples, but as we know them, they were called the Purple Gang. And they were, uh, as I wrote, one of the most vicious and feared crews out of East Harlem who dealt the narcotics, murder, assault, extortion, and they also got into guns internationally, gun running. The Melnish brothers, Michael and, and Joey, were kind of renegades and acting independently of, of the mob. Um, the members of the Purple Gang were kind of deemed like uncontrollable as far as the mob went, even though um, a lot of its members were relatives of friends or guys who were strained out in that life. Um, so in 1991 in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the Lucchese boss, Vicar Musso, was caught while he was on a lamb, while he was on a run, and he was locked up at that time. Anthony uh, Gaspipe, who was the underboss, was also on the lamb at that time. And as I wrote, it was Gaspipe who gave up Vic's location that day, unbeknown to Vic at that time. And um, so the Lucchese's had a void in the in the administration, obviously. And what they did, and as many uh, families do, is they put together a panel. And this panel consisted of Frank Lastarino, Sally Avellino, and Anthony Bowat. And sometime in October of the same year, they were having a meeting and the meeting was to conduct a ceremony to induct new members. Those members were Joe Torti, Frankie Gioia, uh, Gregory Capello, Jody, Jody Calabrese, and, and Thomas, the Ambrosio. Um, it was Anthony Bowat, his childhood friend, who was a cap regime with the, with the Lucchese's at that time, who proposed Thomas, and that was gonna be his skipper. But at some point, Anthony Bowat was put on a shelf, means he was inactive, and he uh, was transferred to Paolo, which is Paul uh, Loduca, he became Thomas's new captain. And Thomas really liked, obviously, both of them. He, he, he loved uh, Bowat, but he also had an affection for uh, Paul, Paolo, as we, as we knew him. He spoke highly of... Uh, Paolo. And in like, as I mentioned, in the early 90s, Thomas came to Fishkill Correction Facility, although it was a drug case, Thomas, Thomas's charges were that he gave up surveillance. So he basically said that they got him on audio, I guess, telling someone probably on a phone that you know, you got bad cars over on, on the block. There's bad cars on the block. He spotted, as I said, he was watching the cars and he spotted these cars that he made out as law enforcement. And at the time we were living in the main building in a unit called 16-2. And that was kind of an honor unit. It was one of the few units that had actual one man cells. It did have a dorm, a dormitory, and you would work your way, your way while living in the dorm, sometimes six months to a year, a year and change or more for a room to open up and you would get yourself into a room, a one man room with, with your own bathroom, which I, I, I was in. We, uh, at that time, it was um, PD Lynx, Bartolomeo, James E. DeServo, who grew up with my parents in East New York, Sally Taddeo, who came from my neighborhood, Frankie Hart Trapetti, who was from the Bronx, 
and myself were on the unit and we had um, Thomas pulled very quickly out of reception into our unit. And he was very happy because we were cooking up there and Thomas, he loved food. So I mentioned that Thomas uh, had given some hints that he was a friend with the Lucchese's and um, he was not doing that in trying to boast. I, I think he was just proud to be who he was. And um, he got along with the guys. And sometimes, you know, guys that are away, people bicker back and forth. And we all had our little differences here and there. But Thomas got along with the guys and they got along with him. Um, he kind of had a, uh, a special affection for me. He took a liking to me. And him and I used to talk at great lengths um, every day. Um, he, as I said, he had an affection for, he was very proud to have come from Harlem, specifically East Harlem. Always spoke about Harlem. Always spoke about the uh, gentleman I, I mentioned, all his childhood friends and others. Um, he mostly spoke about food. He loved to talk about food. As a matter of fact, we were getting uh, food sent into us from Balducci's, um, from Omaha Steaks, and from all these other uh, places that were able to um, deliver to the facility. Um, he also would speak about my upbringing and Ozone Park and Howard Beach. He was very interested in Johnny Gotti and any stories that I have may have known. I, I have written about the, um, the racial war that they had in East New York, which I heard from my parents and other people. I reiterated that story for him and anything else I knew. He was very interested in John Gotti. Um, as I wrote, in contrast to other guys who were in the junk business, Thomas was not taking any other chances. He had told me that, you know, most of the guys in the business were degenerate gamblers. He said, not me. I, I risk my life to do this for my family, and I'm not going to blow it away by gambling. So he was not taking those kind of chances. So Thomas left Harlem, and he moved out to Jersey, Cluster, New Jersey. Um, he had told me that he got together with, with an architect and he had blueprints. And what he did is he doubled, he had the architect double those blueprints up. I, I took that to mean that I guess if he had two stories, it now became four stories. And he also told me that he had the architect spin the blueprints around so that the beauty of his house, typical Thomas, was facing his yard and his pool and the back of his house was facing the street and anyone who was pulling up there would, that's, that's what they would be able to see. You know, he was very, very low key in what he did. Um, I wrote about him having a jailhouse, a jailhouse uh, one of the guys who was a tailor in the, he was on our unit. He was a black guy from Aruba. He was a really nice guy and a very, very good tailor. He would sew by hand. You would think that um, he used the machine. And Thomas, as we all did, had our pants uh, tailored in there and had his pants tailored. And at the bottom on the side near his hem, he had the tailor make this like split in, this, in the side seam so that when he, his pants touched his sneakers, they would like part a little bit. And he had kid around, he would kid around with me and say, you know, this is a Harlem thing. You, you guys from Howard Beach don't know anything about that. And I used to kid around and tell him that's, you know, that's like a, we don't dress like pimps, pimps dress like that. And we, we used to tease each other back and forth, all in good and uh, having fun. Um, I wrote about Thomas had two sons and a daughter and all who he loved equally. 
the apple of his eye was his son named James, and they called him Jamesy. And he was born with a um, kidney disease. And um, he had to be on dialysis. And Thomas, to try to make life simple and easy, easier for him, had the dialysis machines installed in his house. I believe he told me his living room. He had sent his wife uh, and his daughter to classes or school to learn how to operate. And they were basically like nurses to uh, his son. And he would um, always say that it was the curse. He would call it the fucking curse. And what he meant by that was that he felt, and a lot of guys, I've heard this before, that it was the like Babanya curse. And for people who were selling it, they felt that their lives were cursed. And um, at some point, Thomas only had about three years to do, and he was released. It was shortly after his release, and he was home at the time, that James uh, unfortunately passed away from his illness. And, um, you know, as I wrote, you get to know people that you're with, you become very close while you're away. And I became very close with Thomas. And I know still to this day that, you know, he'll never be the same. And um, there was something that was brought to my attention after writing the, um, the story that Thomas also had a son named Thomas, Thomas Jr. And um, if it's accurate, the information I received, Thomas has also lost his other son, I believe, to a heart attack, which blew me away because he was, I think, a year younger than me or my age. So um, back, back to the story. Um, after his son passed away and he was out for a little while, he had visited my mother. My mother was living in Howard Beach at the time. And he had got in touch with her and told her he was coming. And, you know, traditionally in an old school fashion, he brought somebody, he would not enter the house. <laughs> you know, it's almost like visiting somebody's wife, but as visiting their mother, he didn't want to go inside the house. It, it, People, mostly for, for neighbors or people talking, you know, at a man's visit in the house. And he brought his cousin Jamesy with him, who stood in the car. And Thomas, when my mother came down, he spotted the intercom and he asked her, what is that? And she said, oh, that's the intercom. And he right away motioned to, to talk by the, by the curb. He didn't want, he was always afraid of being recorded. And naturally he spoke about the loss of his son, Jamesy. And, you know, he was an emotional guy and that is an emotional thing. And my mother was emotional with him. And, um, but at the end of the day, he, he had asked how I was doing. He asked, you know, if she was okay. He was a very, very good guy, Thomas. And he left her with a, um, an envelope with some money to put in my commissary and a box of Ashton cigars. He knew that we were smoking uh, cigars in there daily, and he sent that. Um, he, he had, him and his family had more misfortune. His son, Thomas, had a daughter, which was Thomas and his wife's first granddaughter, I remember meeting the baby when she came up on the visit. I had Gabby around the same time, my older daughter. And um, Thomas's wife was walking with the baby in their yard and they had two Rottweilers. I believe one's name was Bear and I don't remember the other one's name. And I guess out of jealousy, one of the dogs jumped up and bit the baby's head. I mean, fortunately, the baby survived, but had to get uh, plastic surgery. And 
I know that that also destroyed them. Thomas was a guy who went overboard, especially with the baby. He had his wife, they told me, foam with duct, or he did it, he foamed with duct tape all of the edges so that the baby, if the baby fell, the baby couldn't fall and hit her head on an, on a, on an edge. And he also did that with his own kids while they were growing up. Um, unfortunately, Thomas caught another pinch or case, as we say, this time it was a federal case of drugs. He quickly took a plea and he pled guilty and took a minimal amount of time. He only did a minimal amount of time. It was not long after that his wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was a, a very nice woman named Joni. And um, at that time, Thomas had requested and asked permission to be, to be able to move to Florida. You just can't, once you're in a family, you just can't pack up and leave. Um, as in my case that I did, it's, it's uh, going against the rules. You just can't leave. And uh, Thomas received, I guess, obviously from everything that was going on in his life, he, re he received the blessings to go. And him and his wife went to Florida. Um, as I spoke about, you know, I think no parent, and we all will agree, should live to bury a child. And um, it's just unfortunate that now, if what I'm hearing, he has buried two, two, two of his uh, sons. Um, I don't even know what to say. I, I, I just, you know, I wish the family peace. Um, I wish that his both sons uh, rest in peace. I know Thomas is um, living a legit life in Florida now. He's uh, uh, last I heard his knees were not very good. Um, you know, obviously his wife is in remission from cancer and I'm sure that as a family, they are destroyed by the loss of their sons. And I hope that they have some sort of peace and uh, that's about it. I hope everybody's enjoying their day. If you have not subscribed to this channel, you can do so below. And um, that's about it till the next time. Ciao.